All right. Good morning. It's uh, five o'clock in uh, at least in Europe, and nine o'clock here in Vancouver. So we're ready for the ninth, tenth actually class in the uh, UBC Fish 501 Ecosystem Modeling course, where we today are happy to welcome Jacob Bentley, formerly of SAMS in Open and now with the UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Center. And he will be talking about uh, his work in the Irish Sea on ecosystem-based fisheries management. And uh, before, uh, before we get to that, let me just start off by uh, mentioning that UBC is at Coast Sally's territory. And uh, we acknowledge that we thus are at the ancestral, unceded, and traditional territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish and Musqueam people. And uh, I also acknowledge, would like to advise that uh, we have participants from 29 countries and uh, we are very pleased to see the interest in the course and the wide participation in it. Again, I um, invite you to join the Slack workspace that we have for the course and also to uh, take um, the opportunity to see the recordings which are available at uh, the Ecopart YouTube channel and the Facebook page. Further, I'll uh, remind you that uh, the uh, course website is available at uh, sitesgoogle.com slash view slash fish 501 fish 501 -2021. And with that, we uh, are getting to today's presentation, which as mentioned is by Jacob Bentley. Now Jacob uh, is a fairly new um, PhD. He finished his uh, PhD last year, and he was working for uh, uh, for a number of years, for years or so, I think since 2016, I think, with uh, Sheila, Sheila Heymans uh, in Open, and they read at the Marine Institute in Ireland on modeling work related to the Irish Sea. And it's very fascinating work because not just is the food web work done in very neat, very neatly, as you can some hinting to with this uh, flowchart here. But also that throughout the uh, this work, Jacob engaged with communities, fishing communities, and uh, got input from there. We'll hear more about this in, in the presentation, but also managed to get this into ISIS. So it's actually being the work is being used as in the management process um, quite extensively. It's one of the best cases we have of that. And Jakob has now uh, moved on from this work and he's working with um, UNEP's World Conservation Monitoring Center in Cambridge. Um, and he's working now on things related to marine protected areas, but that's a topic for another discussion. So uh, I will welcome Jakob to uh, give this presentation and also just mention that uh, there's going to be a presentation first, uh, then we're going to take questions and you also, he, Jakob might be asking for questions as we go along. We'll see that how that works out, uh, but we'll take some questions afterwards. And time permitting, he's going to give one more uh, presentation, which is going to be uh, about uh, a routine for time series fitting, an automated routine for time series fitting. It's mainly there to give you uh, an introduction to time series fitting and, and this routine, and also to show you how far we can go with this, that it goes beyond what we'll be doing uh, the week after reading week. So uh, next week, no classes, but when we come back again, we're going to be talking about ECOSIM, we're going to be talking about that time series fitting. And uh, this year, the last presentation, if we have time for it, will be an introduction to that. And with this, I welcome Jakob Bentley uh, and uh, I stop sharing. And 
Jakob, you are welcome to uh, share your screen and uh, take over for the presentation. Thank you, Billy. Um, yeah, that was really cool. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, really, really excited to be speaking on this course um, about the work we did for the RSC. Uh, so it's been about five years, I think, since I first did a EcoPath of EcoSim uh, course with Sheila Heymans and Natalie Sapetti in Natalia Sapetti in uh, the west coast of Scotland at Sounds um, during my masters. And I just kind of fell in love with the place, the people and the work that everyone was doing. And I kind of just stuck around there for a few years and worked on the IRC with them. So it's amazing. I'm glad I wasn't going to be able to share this today. Um, so yeah, like Billy said, I think this is a pretty cool case study, um, mainly because of how closely we were able to work with the fishing industry, um, using different forms of knowledge and integrating it into the ecosystem model. Um, so I'll start by just giving a brief introduction on the Irish Sea. Um, so over the past kind of 50 years, the Irish Sea fisheries have transitioned from being heavily fin fish focused to more kind of crustacea and mollusks with the declining of important stocks like cod, whiting and sole, um, and kind of the increased market demand for uh, invertebrates like nephrops. The whole ecosystem kind of transitioned, uh, the economy kind of transitioned into this in this direction. Um, in the early 2000s, um, the EU tried to implement a cod recovery plan to help uh, cod recover. So uh, the catches and the biomass could increase. Um, they did this through numerous ways. They implemented area closures. There was gear changes, uh, restrictions, uh, different types of allow catches, and also some decommissioning of vessels. Um, but despite all the efforts that were put in, I think some fleets, for example, I think the otter troll, the otter troll fishing effort reduced by about 80% over a few years, despite all of the efforts the fishermen put in and all the legislation that was drawn in. Um, Cods and other stocks showed no sign of recovery, despite some of the single stock assessment models suggesting that these stocks should bounce back with this change in uh, kind of fishing effort. Um, so around 2014, I think people started to get frustrated at the effort they were putting in and not seeing any results. Um, the Northwestern Water Advisory Council, which is led by stakeholders and fishing, the fishing industry in the area, kind of um, came together to ask ICs to hold a benchmark workshop to look at all the models that we're using for this area and start to dig a bit deeper, whether there was some kind of ecological ecosystem reason why uh, stocks weren't recovering as they'd been suggested they might. Um, um, so this led to the establishment of WK Irish, which was, I think it spanned five years overall, it was a, an ICES benchmark workshop. And ICES is the International uh, Council for the Exploration of the Seas. They provide kind of fisheries advice for the North um, East Atlantic waters, um, advice for, for setting catches. Um, so they, they called this group together, uh, which um, consisted of fisheries researchers, single stock analysis and ecosystem modelers, uh, fishers, NGOs and environmental lawyers <coughs> all kind of came together to scope out a direction for research in the area to try and move more towards an ecosystem based approach to fisheries management, trying to incorporate some of the more ecosystem uncertainty into the way we manage the ecosystem. So we could more <coughs> sustainably manage these stocks and hopefully see some form of recovery where we weren't seen it previously. And also just to understand what was going on in the ecosystem. So why, despite all of the, the measures that were being taken, were these stocks not recovering as expected? So the roadmap for this um, five-year process started in 2015 with an information sharing and scoping workshop where everyone came together to kind of decide what tools we had, what, 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 what different modeling approaches could we take to look at this ecosystem and understand it better. Um, Sheila Heymans went to this meeting and at the time she was working with Kieran Turney with the Irish Sea. Um, so she was there to suggest EcoPath of Ecosim be used as a modeling approach to model the Irish Sea ecosystem and develop this ecosystem understanding. Um, lots of other multi-species modeling approaches were also suggested. They also uh, identified that they wanted to carry out kind of an integrated trend analysis to understand the environmental trends a bit better on the Irish Sea. And then the next year in September 2016, there was a big data gathering and evaluation workshop where all the single stock assessors and other researchers got together to pull all the information they had on the biological parameters of the, of the fishing stocks. 
uh, look at the ecosystem models. I think it was here that Fishers identified that they also have knowledge that they'd like to contribute to development of these models. I think they saw an old version of a diet matrix um, from an ecosystem model and uh, saw some things that were funny with it, saw, saw some interactions which might potentially be missing and wanted to contribute their knowledge in the building of a diet matrix for the Irish Sea. So in the third, um, the, third, the third meeting was the single stock assessment meetings. And this was actually, this meeting occurred during the first week of my PhD. Um, and coming from quite an ecological uh, applied background, the first week of my PhD being a stock assessment workshop was, was terrifying. It was super intense. They had a week to deliver. Um, the pressure was insane, um, not only because the modeling work was difficult, but because of the way Doug Irish was set up, there was also um, fishing industry representatives there. So it was a whole different aspect on the importance of these models working properly. Like you could just see, I think it was the herring fishery. Um, the fishermen were saying that they'd seen recovery in the stock for a few years, but the models hadn't been showing that. And this guy was talking in terms of livelihoods and people's jobs and sustaining his community. So seeing modelers talk over biological parameters was just, you could see the tension in the room was crazy, but I think it was really useful to kind of push to some kind of consensus in the end. Um, so that's when I came along and I started building an ecosystem of the RSC around there. And then the following, uh, well, later that year, we got together with the RSC fishermen um, to kind of get the knowledge that they had and integrate it into the model. Um, further down the line, we held like a model review stage to evaluate the model, see if everyone was happy with it in the group. Um, and then in the end of 2019, we tried to find ways to use the ecosystem model that we built to actually get some kind of information out of it that could be put into the IC's advice giving framework, which was pretty difficult because I think um, for a long period ecosystem models have been seen as potentially too complex to feed straight into catch advice, which is totally understandable because I mean, for this kind of work, you want to use the simplest model. So using an ecosystem model, which provides more strategic advice and integrating that somehow into tactical catch advice, we needed to kind of find something creative, a creative way to do that. Um, so these are some of the modeling approaches that were suggested uh, or were, were, were used during WK Irish. I just list them here. Um, I think one of the cool things about WK Irish is they saw the potential for creating an ensemble because obviously with using one single type of model, there's the issue of structural uncertainty and the assumptions that underlay that one model. So we had an ecopath of ecosystem model, which I think everyone's familiar with. Um, and then Rob Fort from CFAS um, was working on a length-based multi-species analysis, which was also kind of a food web model, but it focuses more on the fish component and has like a, a length-based attribute to it, which is really good to look at things like um, changes in size and maturity, the, the way that different gears interact with fish at different life stages, which is a component that Ecopath isn't as good at capturing. So having those two models together was pretty cool. And then there's also a Moses model, which is a model for the simulation of ecological systems. And this focuses more on the, um, the kind of the, 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 the um, metabolic rate of fish. And I think it's quite complicated. All fish aren't aggregated into functional groups and species aren't aggregated into functional groups like an incubator for ecosystem. So it's just a model with hundreds of species in it, each with their own metabolic rates, so hundreds of trends based. They're all kind of getting at the same question. So asking the same question of all these models was hopefully, hopefully going to um, identify some commonalities in the outputs, which would perhaps make us more certain of the, uh, the outputs we were getting, or it would highlight where there was some kind of discrepancies and potentially structural um, uncertainty. And we also, they also developed an FQ model for the region, which isn't a food web model, but again, it's another way to look at multi-species. Um, it's used to produce mixed fisheries advice and forecast potential overfishing um, undershoots based on existing fishing opportunities. Um, so yeah, going forward with this set of models, we were hopeful that we were going to produce some conclusive uh, results for the fishermen. Um, so previous work uh, in the Irish Sea. So before we started, um, uh, Steve Mackinson at CFAS had built a, a ecopath ecosystem model for the Irish Sea, which at the time of Doka Irish was being used by Kieran Turney with some eco tracer work. Um, if you get the chance to read his paper, it's really cool. Um, there's some videos to show. Uh, uh, so, so what EcoTracer does is there's, there's a plugin in Ecosin now, uh, in, in Ecopath Ecosin, where you can track contaminants through the food web as they bioaccumulate. Um, in the, the Irish Sea, there's a nuclear waste facility called Sellafield, which um, pumps radio, um, 
and carbon 14, I think, into the into the ocean. And Kieran was tracking that through the food web, um, ground truthing it with samples from marine mammals he found. Um, so that was really, really good. And the fishermen actually, when we presented this, were quite interested in using this carbon 14 to trace fish that they think have been migrating out of their region. So this was really cool way to kind of talk to the fishermen and come up with new potential avenues for research that have done the way. Um, we didn't end up using the Elisa Mackinson model because we wanted to work closely with fishermen and use their knowledge. Um, we decided to build our own model from scratch. We kind of used theirs as a skeleton to identify what was in the ecosystem. Um, but because it's from 2007, we wanted to be sure about where our data came from. And I think when you're using someone else's model, so many parameters in these models, it can be quite difficult to track where everything comes from. So we wanted to start from scratch uh, and build something new. So this is the IRC EcoPath model. You probably see for most of my PhD, I drew fish. It was a, a, a labor of love, I think. Um, but we had 41 functional groups. Uh, mostly focused on the fish in the ecosystem because this is what the stakeholders and the fishers were interested in. This is what our question revolved around because we were trying to determine why these specific commercial groups weren't recovering very well. We had some multi stanza groups. So we had cod, place, uh, whiting and haddock split into adult and juvenile groups. Um, and we also had kind of the marine mammals and the, the large traffic levels, which are more integrated into larger species functional groups. Um, to keep track of all this, we put everything into a technical report, which if you're interested, um, is online. Um, the cool thing about this model is it's built with really great stomach data from the CFAS um, DAPSOM database, which has stomach records going back to about, um, I think we use stomach records from 1960 all the way up to present day. So we had really great kind of uncertainty around our diets for each different uh, predator-prey interaction. Um, and you can see there's a whole host of places where we got information for this model from. So all the stock assessments from ICs, and then we use fish base and sea life base for lots of the um, underlying uh, um, kind of vital ratios and vital rates. Um, and then also lots of catch data from the European Commission STDCF database. And also the Southwest Continuous Plankton Recorder, which has been going for decades, um, gave us some really great trends for plankton and zooplankton in the Irish Sea. Uh, but the coolest thing about the model was definitely the fact that it had fishers' knowledge integrated into it, um, and that we built it alongside them and co-produced it uh, with the fishers and other stakeholders. Um, I mean, they, they told us what species they wanted to see as, as uh, separate functional groups, what species they were interested in looking at um, independently. Um, so that they, they were vital in kind of rearranging the structure of the model, but also feeding information into the model. Um, so during WKRH4, when we had these workshops, they were attended by um, some environmental NGOs, fishers, and also the representatives of the fishing industry, um, and then governmental researchers, academic researchers, and ICs advisors. So everyone was in the room at every stage of this kind of, which really helped as we get towards the end to kind of streamline the outputs from this work into some form of advice. Um, the, week show, the workshops were held over five days, um, which was pretty intense. And it was um, really great that the fishers came along to that because five days for a, for a fish is a long time to spend um, sitting in a boardroom listening about ecosystem models. But I think because they were so invested in the work from the output, because these are questions that they wanted answered, that they were eager to come along every time. Now we held them in Ireland and Northern Ireland because this uh, made it easier for them to kind of join us, we held it in Dublin most of the time. Um, and they were chaired by researchers and also fisheries representatives. We made sure that the workshops were chaired by people that the fishermen kind of had uh, good relationships with. So my um, PhD supervisor, Dave Reed, he's been working with these fishers for a long time now. And that really helped kind of um, have that trust going in. So we could have these informal talks and um, kind of back and forth and the trust was there so that they felt that they could share their knowledge with us, which was really good. And the key thing was that they were really informed. So I think when I went into the first meeting, I'd printed out a load of um, food web diagrams that I thought, I'll give one of these to each of the fishermen and they'll just draw a food web for me and tell me who eats who. Um, but that didn't work at all. And they were much more interested in sharing stories and kind of 
um, sharing knowledge through that kind of dialogue. So all sitting back and discussing, and that was much more engaging for them. Um, so, so it was a steep learning curve for me. It was the first time I've done this kind of social uh, work, um, but I was working with some great uh, social scientists as well. So it really kind of helped to pull it all together. Um, so the knowledge that we asked the fishermen for, or that they said that they wanted to contribute, well, they, they really wanted to contribute the diet stuff because they felt they had good kind of inherited and um, experiential knowledge from when they're working on the boats of what a certain um, what certain species eat. I think they they um, they had a good handle on like cod, rays, uh, whiting, haddock, which they've been working with for a long time. So they were able to give us detailed kind of uh, you see the diagram there, just just kind of hand drawn on a on a whiteboard um, diets that we were able to feed into the model, um, and they also gave us some historic fishing effort trends. So for the Irish Sea, we could only find fishing effort for a few fleets from two thousand and three onwards. I think for Otter Beam and Nephrops trawls, which were in the model, we had um, information going back to the start of the model for them, which was in nineteen seventy three. We went back so far because um, from 1973 onward, there were some pretty key moments in the ecosystem with the overfishing of different groups, um, shifts in kind of the, the phytoplankton, the, uh, the zooplankton community. And um, so we wanted to capture that by going all the way back to 1973. But of course, a lot of the data wasn't available going back then, especially for things like the um, potting fleet and stuff like that. We could only find data from 2003 onwards for them. Um, so fishers said that they could contribute this because they've been, well, a lot of the fishermen that came along had been at sea for that long. If not, they had relatives that were there back then. So they, uh, they were confident they could draw something for us. Um, so we ended up using Fisher's knowledge on diets and putting that into the model and also the Fisher's knowledge on um, historic fishing effort and putting that into the model. So what we wanted to kind of question is what are the impacts of the Fisher's diet changes on the structure of the model, or the functioning of the model, and also how does the fishing effort trends that they put in make the model perform? Does it make the model better or does it make it worse? Now, before I go on, has anyone got any questions? No. Okay. Any questions? No? Yeah, I was trying to unmute here. All right. Uh, uh, yeah, I was really interested in seeing the presentation here, uh, how it was in the room where it, things happened. Uh, how did you get fishermen to buy into this, to actually take, spend the time that it takes? It's a, it's a major commitment. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I think it was because it came from them originally. I think they were so fed up initially with... Um, maybe having the blame placed on them, but they were also really interested in the underlying features of the ecosystem and what was going on. I'd never met people that were more um, interested in the sustainability of the ecosystem than they were. Um, I had fishermen telling me that they wanted their, their kids to get into the fishing industry and follow their lead. But they didn't want it to happen if there wasn't going to be a job for them in the future. So that's a lot of pressure to, to put on someone to go away and tell them if there's going to be any jobs for the future. But I think they were just inherently wanted wanted to be part of this research. And I think the fact that they had such strong relations with the, the Marine Institute scientists that were there, the meetings were being chaired by the fishing organisations. So I think that because the groundwork was there, the trust was there, and this is something that's been ongoing for years. By 2008, 17, they were just, they were ready to go. Um, so yeah, I think, and I think having it close to home made it a lot, e a lot easier for them. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Anything else? Okay, I'll carry on. Um, so first I'll talk about the impact of Fisher's knowledge on the, um, the structure and function of the ecosystem. I think uh, Billy said to me, you looked at network indicators um, a, couple of, a couple of days ago in another lecture. Uh, but we wanted to see how the addition of Fisher's knowledge impacted these kind of indicators. So is the health of the ecosystem different once we include Fisher's knowledge? To, does it change the way that we see the ecosystem? Um, so we picked just a few key um, ecological network analysis indicators here. So total system flow through, 
um, average path length, uh, thin cycling index and indirect flow intensity. Um, and initially here, what you see on the left is just an example of the whiting diet, um, just, just using um, stomach record data at this point uh, to get these snapshot uh, indicator values. Um, but what we wanted to do, because we had just this whole wealth of stomach contents data, we wanted to explore the uncertainty within that data. So we could, instead of getting a single value for a uh, network indicator, we wanted to get kind of a distribution value for that indicator. Um, and we ended up using a plugin called ENAR uh, to do this, because I think in Ecopath Ecosystem at the moment, you can explore the impact of the uncertainty in diets, but it, it more applies a pedigree across the whole diet of a, speed, of, of a functional group. So uh, I don't know, like a 50% confidence interval around the entire diet, diet of whiting. Um, but what we had with our data was we had kind of asymmetrical, I'll show you, we had kind of asymmetrical uncertainty around every single value, every single predator-prey interaction. So we wanted to explore the variability in there and how that impacted um, impacted these indicators. So we exported the path model and turned it into a network object in R and then ran it through this ENAR plugin, which generated 10,000 models just by altering uh, diets within the plausible ranges of uh, this er these error bars. So we're able to get these kind of distributions. Um, once we added Fisher's knowledge, you see the, there's some new prey identified, which were included in the model, and it changed a little bit across the other prey. But he's got, again, a snapshot for the ecosystem uh, variable. Um, but then when we ran the uncertainty analysis, we got the distributions. And what we found with the addition of Fisher's knowledge at this point was that it didn't have a huge impact on these whole ecosystem indicators. Um, which is perhaps unsurprising when we consider that the fish has only altered the diets of about, I think it was about five functional groups in the model, five or six functional groups in the model with about 41 functional groups. Um, and they identified, fish has identified 80 predator prey interactions, um, 50 of which were already in the model. Um, so, so it's 30 new additions and changes that they made. So the impact at this scale at the whole ecosystem level was small. Um, but when we moved on to look at the impact on kind of an interspecific level, this is where we found that the fishes actually had changed the way the model was working and had had some impact with their diet knowledge. Um, so on the right is a mixed trophic impact um, kind of distribution plot. Um, the mixed trophic impact kind of shows uh, the impact one species has on another when its biomass increases. So is it if the, if the biomass of tooth wells increase, how would it impact the biomass of uh, girders or something else? So it's kind of a uh, looking at how, 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 how different groups control the flow of energy within the ecosystem. Um, and when we had, when we just had Fisher's knowledge in, so I've got an example here of discards. When we just had scientific knowledge in, we found that discards played a significant role of energy flow to seabirds, um, crabs and lobsters, um, and other groups. But when we added Fisher's knowledge into the model, um, we had impacts on whiting, rays, and place from discards because they were able to identify these interactions which weren't available to us in the stomach record, so we couldn't identify in the literature. Um, and I picked discards because it was quite important at the time. I think the landings obligation just came in, so any outputs that we were getting from the model um, had implications for the importance of discards to a range of different preys, just by a range of different species, just by including Fisher's knowledge. Um, and then moving on to the impact of Fisher's uh, knowledge on fishing effort trends. So here is a initial snapshot of some model predictions when we used the um, fishing effort that was available to us in scientific data. So we had fishing effort for beam trawls, otter trawls, and nephrops trawls. Um, you see the, the, the model predictions uh, sit quite closely to a lot of the observed data. So we used, um, we used the Monte Carlo approach, and uh, I, I don't know if you've, you've spoken about this yet, but we assigned pedigree, diff different pedigree values to our ecopath input. And when we simulated this in ecosim, we used Monte Carlo to generate um, a thousand model, iter model iterations uh, which gives us this uh, range of uncertainty around our base model predictions, which is the black line. And we used a plugin called EcoSampler to, help, um, uh, to, to export all of this. Uh, something that was developed a couple of years ago um, and has been an absolute lifesaver because it keeps track of every single 
Monte Carlo iteration and allows you to run so so you can generate a thousand different models and you can run them all through ecopath and send output to a folder and then play with it all in r so it's really really good for kind of manipulating data i'm not sure if you're going to speak about that at some point in the course but ecosampler is um, a godsend um but anyway the issues we were having with the initial uh just using scientific data is we couldn't capture a lot of the trends you see on the right so lobsters and crabs catches and other data poor stocks because we didn't. We wanted to use fishing effort in this model to force fishing over time. Um, we could have forced the catch of these stocks, but we wanted fishing effort in there because this was something that was tangible to the fishers that they could play with when it came to scenarios, changing the fishing effort over time. And for crabs and lobsters, we didn't, every formula, we didn't have any fishing effort trends for the potting fleets and some other fleets, so we just couldn't capture those dynamics with uh, the information we had. Um, so the fishers. Uh, drew these trends for us on, on the left through, again, just in a big room. We all sat around and discussed stories going back in time of um, when different uh, fish industries started, when different fleets started operating, when otter trawls kind of diverted from being targeted at uh, whitefish to more being targeted at nephrops. And they drew these trends for us. But the issue that we had when we in implemented these trends into the model, because you have to convert them into anomaly, so in the initial year it starts at one and then kind of uh, the line acts as a, a multiplier of that initial value, um, it killed everything. Um, so everything in the model pretty much crashed. Um, initially, we, went, we well, I think we're not too sure why it's happened. It could have been because we, uh, the way we worded what we wanted to fishers wasn't right. We asked them for kind of the killing power of the fleet, but I think they more carried away in kind of the magnitude of change that they had in their heads. And, and it kind of, it, yeah, so it was quite, a lot, uh, they, they, so they said some fleets increased by 70 times effort, which was just a huge impact to the model and the model couldn't sustain that kind of catch. Um, but when we looked at the trends that they gave us compared to where we did have data, what we noticed for a lot of them is there was really decent comparisons between uh, the trends the fishers were giving us and the trends that we had. So, so for example, nephrops, they caught that quite well. They, they, they don't get the interannual variability. They get a lot of the ups and downs, the increases and decreases. But for example, what you see for nephro, nephrops with the anomaly from the data increases by about 1.6 times um, over the course of the period. But with the fishing effort from fishers, the magnitude was 70 times higher. So I think when we put that into the model, that ended up um, having the nephrops fleet by catching about uh, four times the available biomass of cod, so the ecosystem couldn't sustain the effort at the original raw trends that the fishes had drawn. Um, so we kind of proceeded with the assumption that whilst the magnitude of change that the fishes suggested might not be accurate, we were pretty confident in the trends and the stories they were telling us. So we wanted to carry those trends forward and convert them into some kind of um, driver for fishing effort in the Irish Sea. Um, so what we did, we used this kind of base approach where we produced a um, uncertainty bound around the fishers trends so that the fishers trends became more these distributions of potential trends. So we know that the trend looks like this, but we're not sure what the magnitude is. Um, and we used, um, so, so we, we used Multisim, which is another plugin ecosim where you can, um, it's kind of, you, you can automatically perturb the environment and anthropogenic drivers and collate ecosystem out, um, outputs. So you create a series of time series. Um, so you can, when you feed a, a fishing effort time series into, into ecosystem, um, it pr produces biomass and catch outputs based on fishing intensity in, in that time series. And what ecosystem, <coughs> what multisim does is you can create hundreds or thousands of different time series, all of different efforts, and you can feed them in and see how these different efforts impact the catch and the biomass. So what we did is we created 10,000 random um, CSV files with efforts within these distributions from each fleet um, and fed these into the model to kind of uh, find out which sets of fishing effort within these distributions led to the best uh, statistical fit within the model. Um, so we found that uh, when we fed the 10,000, I think in the end it ended up being 40,000 CSVs through multi-sim, it, it turned out that when you decrease the magnitude of, for example, being trawled by 96%, um, in, in, in the, you were able to 
well, we were able to fit better the biomass and catch trends of, ecos of um, different stocks. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Um, so when we added these adjusted trends back into the model, um, you can see that the model was much more capable of replicating uh, a lot of the trends. Nothing died as, as to the extent it did previously, but the, the most interesting thing was that we were starting to get um, decent replications of uh, things such as the landings of crabs and lobsters, which we weren't able to do previously. <coughs> Um, and then as a final simulation, we decided to kind of make a hybrid model where we took the, um, the beam true, water true, and nephrops true that we had from scientific data and combined it with the adjusted uh, Fisher's effort trends. And this is where we found we could get our, our best model fit going forward because we were able to get some of the interannual variability from these true trends, but we were also to capture, able to capture the dynamics of things like louses and crabs, which we weren't able to do uh, without the Fisher's knowledge. So it kind of took the strengths of both this, the, the model driven by scientific knowledge and the model driven by adjusted fissure knowledge and discounted their weaknesses and pro produced a model that we were much more happy with. Yeah, so the model produced the best overall fit to time series when it included scientific and fissure knowledge. Um, it kind of produced a lot of the landings data without fissure's knowledge. Um, but what we found when we were fitting the model was that um, it, it appeared that there was an environmental variable that was also important to uh, the underlying dynamics of the of the Irish Sea. So we were when we were fitting model, we were estimating an anomaly on primary production, um, and every time every every model fit here produced a a, a primary production anomaly which correlated well with things like temperature and the AMO and the North Atlantic Oscillation. So we were aware that there was some kind of environmental variability that was important to actually accurately replicate the dynamics of the ecosystem, but we were unsure of what this environmental variability was, um, which takes me on to the next point. But before I get there, I think I'll stop quickly and just ask if there are any questions. Sarah and Andrew. <laughs> um, so Sarah said, you mentioned the fishermen were not interested in enjoying the food web. How did you get them to describe the predator-prey relationships through sharing their stories? No, so they weren't interested in drawing them independently. So we gave them uh, uh, the, the sheets to have a look at, but I think they ended up just doodling on those sheets. But what they did enjoy was sitting around a flipboard with one person at the flipboard, and they were kind of chatting amongst them of what they've seen and what they haven't seen. And that person at the flipboard was kind of frantically trying to capture everything they were saying. And at the same time, we had... Um, we had someone on the laptop at the other end of the room that was projecting pictures of fish onto TVs that were around this area. So uh, if, one person, if one fisher was talking about a species that no one had heard of before, they could project it onto the screens and then everyone was like, oh yeah, yeah, we've seen that, but we call it this kind of thing. And, and so it was more of a kind of discussion environment. And so that's how we got around that. Um, and it did, it was a lot of stories. I think we were, we were quite surprised by a lot of things. Like there was one fishing fleet that the effort had changed dramatically over time and we thought it might have been due to changing opportunities or something like that but the fishermen were telling us oh no that was actually because at that time some monks came over with these boats and introduced this form of fishing so it's just stuff that we would have never as scientists as, as like fisheries ecologists potentially thought of um, having the social scientists in the room and engaging these methods and kind of co-producing this knowledge together made it a much kind of stronger stronger experience and really kind of Built the investment that they had in the whole process. <clears throat> right. Uh, Thank you. No worries. That's perhaps. Uh, uh, did you want to add to this? Um, as a follow-up Sarah's question, I'd be interested to know how you captured the fish knowledge and translated it into the model. Yeah, so the fishes. They, they weren't very quantitative, it was much more qualitative. So they, we drew, the, um, we, we drew them, the, the food webs down with the names linking to the predator and prey. And in a lot of occasions, fishers said that they find this a lot or they don't find it a lot. So they kind of quantified it in that way. Um, so when it came to actually adding the interactions into the model, we used that a lot and not a lot kind of, um, kind of 
well, yeah, kind of sparingly, we kind of had to kind of guess. But what we did have, which was really useful, was the uncertainty bounds around all of the other information from the stomach records. So when we added um, the, the, the qualitative, data in, qualitative data into the model, we could um, kind of manipulate the other data within known ranges. So we could play with it that way. But also, because this was a large area of uncertainty, when it came to producing model simulations, uh, we put large confidence intervals around any um, any species diet that had been changed by fishers, just so we could try and account for uncertainty. Great. Jakob, um, you found that the trends for effort from the fishermen was uh, quite reliable, but not the amplitude. Yeah. Uh, getting to realizing that, I mean, this is not really surprising. We uh, generally in time series, it's the trend that's that's the mm -hmm. that's the signal mm -hmm. more than more than the amplitude. But um, how did how did you get to those nice plot at the end and Which figuring part? out how how on earth to go about it when when your model was just crashing on you when you started off? Um. I think we were adamant that we really wanted to use this information. Um, so it was a lot of determination and the fact that the trends lined up so nicely as well with the, the actual trends, forgetting about the magnitude, we saw the value in the fish's knowledge and it was clear that they knew that they were talking about. Um, so how did I get to, sorry, do you mean like actually what, what kind of- I'm, 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 I'm just thinking about how much struggle there was in the process of getting from the model is crashing to some complicated and neat plots at the end. It was quite, it was quite, I think it was, um, I think we came to the idea quite quickly. We were lucky at the time because we had a Bayes uh, mathematician working with us who was doing some work in New Zealand and she was over for like a month working with Sheila. So we took the, um, we, we kind of spoke through it with her about what we could do. And when we decided that instead of looking at these fishes trends as just a single trend at a single magnitude and potentially turning them into a distribution of magnitudes instead and kind of running every possible combination of magnitude through the multi-sim component. It was pretty quick to get an output because the more that we were finding that we uh, manipulated the, uh, the, the change the magnitudes towards the, the magnitudes which produce the best overall fits, the quicker the model started to look quite nice and work really well. Um, and the magnitudes that came out at the end for the Fisher's trends that were um, that we had data for those magnitudes matched really well onto the magnitude of change that we saw in the actual data as well. So we were able to kind of validate it a little bit that way too. Great, thank you. All right, thank you, Spencer. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, I, mean, I mean, you're about to get to it because I saw that your next slide is about. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's see the slide then. Okay. Uh, I'll keep on going then, unless there's any other questions, and talk about the plankton and stuff now. Cool. Uh, share screen. Okay. Right, so onto the environmental driver stuff. Um, so as I said, when we fitted the model previously, we used kind of the traditional approach of model fitting in Ecosim, where you estimate and anomaly on the primary production rate, because this captures a lot of the um, environmental variability, hopefully, and we can, uh, after, we've, after we've predicted what this anomaly should look like, we can, people tend to go out and say, this anomaly resembles changes in temperature. So maybe it was changes in temperature that this model was trying to capture by, by estimating this anomaly on primary production. Um, but when I took this to WKR-ish five, so, so the fifth meeting where we wanted to evaluate the model, um, a lot of people are kind of unhappy with this, especially the kind of integrated trend analysis people, and also a phytoplankton expert of the Irish Sea, who was 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 not confident that the Irish Sea prime production had trained changed that much at all over the time series, um, and it was suggested by integrated trend analysis work that a lot of the changes in the Irish Sea were actually originating from changes in uh, secondary production, changes in small zooplankton and large zooplankton communities, and abundance. So they were saying that while we were able to get a good fit of the model by just estimating a prime production anomaly, um, experts believe that this wasn't the best way to fit this model in a mechanistic sense. Whilst we're getting the trends we're interested in, the mechanistic route through which we're adding environmental variability to the model 
wasn't wasn't correct. So we took a, a leaf out of Mackinson's book instead. He published this really cool paper in 2014 where he raised the importance of conducting uh, modeling and empirical analysis in parallel. So looking at all the trends you have available for the region and identifying potential interactions and drivers of the ecosystem before um, kind of estimating these anomaly so you can understand maybe what's going into you and what's, what's driving the system and integrate it a lot more mechanistically and systematically rather than through a fitting process. Um, so what we ended up doing for this part of the analysis was we got together um, all the big environmental trends that we thought would be important for the ecosystem, um, as well as the lower trophic productivity trends, which we got from the continuous plankton recorder. So we had the phytoplankton color index and small zooplankton, the large zooplankton abundance. Um, we also got together the fisheries um, recruitment trends for uh, the important commercial stocks. And we conducted kind of a, um, a correlation analysis to identify where we might be expecting to see links and how these links may be driving different stock recruitments and uh, productivity rates. Um, and in the Irish Sea, you can see on the, uh, through the plots, there was a lot of changes. So there was a lot of changes on the fishing side of things. The, the ecosystem really shifted in that sense, but there was also kind of this big environmental, um, I think kind of regime shift where, which was um, kind of signified by a decline in cod, the increase in temperatures, the decline in zooplankton. Um, so there was a lot going on with the environmental signals as well as the changes in fishing at the time. Right, so when we came down to the correlation analysis, which we um, corrected for autocorrelation, uh, we picked out quite a few significant interactions. Um, the ones that we ended up adding to the model, uh, we identified an interaction between small, uh, large zooplankton and the NAO, which we were able to find literature to support as well. Um, changes in temperature and uh, changes in wind pressure uh, in, in, in impacting the mortality of large zooplankton in the Irish Sea. So we implemented that, uh, uh, the NAO as a direct driver of large zooplankton mortality in the model, instead of having any changes impacting prime production, we added this, this NAO driver to large zooplankton mortality. And we also found um, temperature and the AMO to correlate with COD and whiting recruitment. Um, so we added uh, temperature as a driver of the recruitment of whiting and cod in the model. Um, other interactions that we found uh, that we kind of didn't place too much weight on was one between herring um, and the NAO. Uh, when we took that to the group, it was suggested that this might not be a direct impact. They often find that the, um, the, the impact between herring and the NAO is lagged and it's much more likely to be an interaction between the herring and the availability of its prey. Um, which there was a couple of papers published beforehand to suggest that. So instead of adding anything to drive herring, for example, um, it was likely that by capturing the changes in large zooplankton, uh, through adding the NAO to drive of large zooplankton, we'd actually see that uh, bottom-up impact propagate throughout the ecosystem model and impact herring. And again, we found correlations between um, the, the um, phytoplankton color index and temperature and other environmental drivers, but we were warned off against using this and we were told not to use this in the end because there was a lot of uncertainty in this as an index of prime production um, in the Irish Sea. Um, so I've just put here kind of a table of model fits, um, which shows that the structured addition of environmental drivers in this way um, into the ecosystem model improves the simulations against data when compared to the previous uh, model iterations. So in scenario one, where we didn't have a prime production anomaly estimated by the model, we didn't add any forcing, we just estimated uh, predator-prey vulnerabilities and predator vulnerabilities. Uh, we got the worst fitting model. Um, and then when we, so this prime production anomaly, this was coming from the previous work I showed you with the Fisher's effort. Um, the model improved, but not as much as it did when we started to systematically add environmental drivers into the model. So when we added AMO, um, and then we added AMO and the NAO to large zooplankton, AMO to fish recruitment. Uh, we were seeing the model get uh, better every time. And then again, we added depth integrated temperature uh, functional responses in the final iteration so that um, the, the functional groups could, uh, their, their consumption rates could respond to changes in temperature over time, which we wanted to implement because uh, we were looking to generate um, climate change scenarios down the line. So we wanted to have tolerance ranges to temperature incorporated into the model we found that having these uh, temperature responses in the model also improved the fit overall. So this systematically, the systematic addition of environmental variability proved to be a much more 
uh, uh, well, um, a much better way to fit the model and, and produce um, stronger correlations, uh, stronger, stronger fits to observe data. Um, and we're also able to answer some of the questions that fishers were interested in because at the end of the day, the thing they wanted to know was, um, well, as well as can we integrate it into management, they wanted to know what was going on in the ecosystem. So we carried out a retrospective analysis where we fitted the model with the systematic addition of environmental drivers and without to kind of tease apart what the impact of the environment had been on these, on these stocks. Um, we found that for COD, if we didn't have environmental variability in the model, the biomass increased post 1990 when fishers had begun to re reduce their efforts and uh, management plans are coming from the EU to, for the COD recovery plans and area closures. So it suggested that without the environmental variability, COD would have recovered faster than we had seen. The, catching up to the, the, the catch opportunities, the fishing opportunities might have been a bit greater. For whiting, we didn't see such a change. Without the environment, whiting still um, still crashed in the ecosystem model. Um, it, was, it, was, it wasn't as fast, but it did go down because the fishing effort for whiting was just so high um, and they were a big discard in the nephrops fleet, which uh, had increased over time um, as nephrops become more profit, profitable, profitable and other opportunities had declined. Um, haddock, we were never able to capture the high peaks in haddock because its recruitment was so uh, variable. Let's just switch one here. Um, but what we were able to do is capture the general increase in haddock, but we found that without the environmental uh, drivers, haddock didn't show this increase because of the interaction between cod and haddock. So this is a predation interaction between cod, where when cod decreases, it releases haddock and allows it to increase in the ecosystem, which has been found in a few other re regions as well, this relationship between cod, haddock and whiting. Um, place and soil, we didn't find any strong impact of the environment on these stocks, um, but with herring, we found that without the environment, it didn't have these, these troughs here with the decreases, which was due to the low availability of uh, zooplankton prey. So this was an impact of there not being enough prey for the stock that uh, led to these decreases. Um, and nephrops again showed a greater decrease without environmental variability, again, because of the increased predation pressures. So what we were finding was there was uh, direct impacts of temperature, but also the impacts of predator prey interactions was strongly driving uh, the, the trends throughout the model. Um, so then finally, some catch uh, simulations, so the total catch, the catch of fish, and invertebrate catch and stuff like that. So from this study, we found that um, the simulations indicated that the bottom-up processes, uh, so changes in temperature and changes in, in uh, uh, the zooplankton community, had suppressed the overall production of fin fish in the RHC, limiting opportunities for the fishing industry, but also dampening the rate of stock recovery despite all of the uh, effort implementations and changes that have been made since the early 2000s. Okay, so before I go on, I'll stop again, just in case there are any questions at that point. Yes, Spencer, did that answer your question about incorporating the plankton into the model? Absolutely, super interesting. Awesome. Thanks so much. No problem. Yeah, I had a question about how you move from the uh, cross correlation, um, like the first model, to then determining the five different scenarios that you would then run in your ecosystem model. I imagine it'd be easy to end up with 25 or a whole ton of scenarios. And I can tell you really thought through what is the most plausible and useful uh, scenarios um, that you could then operationalize from this. Um, how did you kind of get to those five? So those five scenarios, that was kind of the, um, I'll get that back again. It was kind of the general transition between, um, it, was, it was the process of thinking throughout the whole, uh, the whole kind of line of work as we started without any anomalies and then this is kind of this is the traditional way to fit the model so estimating a prime production anomaly um that's kind of where where we are normally at and that's where we identified um uh, some kind of environmental variability that would have been impacting the model so that was our starting point for this project of being more systematic because we knew that something was impacting the model uh, some form of environmental change was important in the model because we were much better able to replicate observed data but we weren't sure what it was 
And then here we were just added uh, them one at a time just to see how they're independently added. We also did this for just the NAO on its own, the NAO. Yeah. So we, we, did, right. we did more combinations, but they all kind of showed the same thing of the more, the more interactions we captured, the better we were able to fit the model in this aspect. But yeah, there's loads of different ways you could do this. Um, yeah, the opportunities are limitless with this program. <laughs> and uh, a comment on the question here. First of all, if you're finding that this is you, you've been this is a downside of the English language. You can't tell the difference between what I'm talking to one or many. Uh, in this case, you participants. If you find this awfully complicated, uh, yes, it can it can be made very complicated. Uh, but when we start working on it, we'll start going to start from the simple ends. And I think a really neat aspect of this is that it illustrates that you can take it much further as Jakob uh, just hinted to. Uh, and my question, Jakob, is uh, relates to the, the fitting of the vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious about here, you're using a combination of fitting for predator. Yeah. So you have predator vulnerabilities, but you've also picked out some predator-prey vulnerabilities. So combinations there. Mm -hmm. um, what was the process involved in this? And are the prey, predator prey vulnerabilities, I presume they are for predators that are not fitted uh, otherwise, or, or how did you how did you go about this? What was the thinking? Yeah, so the thinking behind that was that when we we wanted to capture the overall impact that the predators were having on their prey, because I mean, generally speaking, a predator may have a top-down impact on the majority of its prey, but there may be some interactions based on habitat and location where the impact on that specific uh, prey would be bottom up or it would be changed in some way. So we, when we were fitting the, um, when we were using the uh, automated fitting plugin, you had the option of either fitting for predator vulnerabilities or predator prey vulnerabilities. You can't try both. So what we initially did was we used the uh, automated fitting plugin to fit just for predator prey vulnerabilities. And then uh, when we, if we had situations where we hadn't estimated our maximum number of parameters based on overfitting, so we had uh, 52 calibration time series, and as a rule of thumb, that means we shouldn't estimate more than 51 parameters, or else we'd be in risk of a greater risk of overfitting the model. So when we had um, examples of uh, only estimating, <clears throat> for example, in the first one, we had 29 parameters which had been estimated, we went back into Ecosim and used the uh, the front end in Ecosim to search for the most sensitive predator-prey vulnerabilities within the matrix without changing the ones that had been uh, 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 estimated by the predator vulnerabilities and to see if changing them improved the model at all. Okay, uh, Bia, do you want to uh, add, ask about the splines? Yes, so I was curious about why did you choose like uh, four splines for the primary production anomaly. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that was um, estimated by the model. So when we run the um, automated fitting plugin, it has the options of estimating uh, a scenario with 10 vulnerabilities and one spline point, 10 vulnerabilities and two spline points, 10 vulnerabilities and three spline points, 10 vulnerabilities and four spline points. And the spline points uh, dictate how much movement the trend has over time. Um, we tend to stick with, when we're running the fitting plugin, to estimate a maximum of five spline points, because that kind of gives us, um, it means it means the trend won't change erratically every decade. It gives us more of a smooth trend, which we're expecting to see driving the model. So these changes, these large changes in the AMO and the NAO, they tend to be smooth over time. So we estimate up to like a maximum of five spline points or one spline point per decade. Um, so this, in this scenario, it just happened that the best fitted model estimated the spline point with uh, estimated the prime production on these four spline points that kind of had like the kind of looked like that over time. So it had like a spline point up here and down here and at the end to kind of dictate that curviness. So we, we allowed for a maximum of five because we didn't want it to be too wiggly. It just so happened in the best fitting scenario, it chose four spline points as the best fitted iteration. And it keeps the number of estimated parameters down. Oh, yeah. um, and, and just a general comment here, if um, for participants, if you're not familiar with the AICC, the Archaic Information Criteria, corrected version here, do read about AIC uh, before we start talking about time series. Okay, I think that covers so the question we have here. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so yeah, so moving on. So after doing all this research and finding out the impact of Fisher's knowledge on the model, um, also kind of trying to identify ways the environment might be impacting the model, the key thing here would now was to go back to the fishers and the stakeholders and disseminate uh, what we'd learned to them uh, because they were the key drivers of this whole process. They, their knowledge was fundamental to building the model, but also uh, pushing the model forward. Um, so we made these really cool uh, research briefs, which started off with a, a blurb about EcoPath of Ecosim on the front, along with the highlights. Um, I think these are online as well, if you want to download them. Um, but inside we had a picture of the food web so that showed them all the interactions, as well as their interactions placed on top, so fishers could see uh, where the knowledge had been integrated into the model. We made some nice infographics to show them how we'd use the model and then also showed fishers that, um, you know, the, the addition of their knowledge had improved the fit of the model and also some of the initial results that we were getting back from the environmental analysis was included in this. So it was a really cool way to um, get the results back to the fishermen. I think they all, they all took like five each, so they really, really appreciated that. Um, so I just put here some of the key lessons as well from WK Irish that were key to the positive stakeholder engagement. Uh, so firstly, the research was initially requested by the fishing industry, which means that they had buy-in from the start. We didn't have to kind of uh, chase them at all. They were really interested um, in, in this entire process. Uh, they, I mean, I think I like I like to think there was a, a link between it. But after I handed out these research briefs, I, I, I remember finding online one of the recreational fishers had written a blog about the importance of the ecosystem and the ecosystem functioning. So it was, it was really great having this kind of outreach and being able to have this dialogue. Um, and trust being established prior to Dunkin' Iris was super important um, because it means we could go in with having open conversations. Um, uh, I remember in one of the later meetings, we had uh, a new fisher representative there. Um, along with all the other fish representatives and someone asked the question of having an observer on your boat does it change your behavior when you're fishing and all of the ones that we've known for ages instantly said yes and the other one that was new said no straight away and they all just like looked at each other and you could just see that the trust that built up over time and allowed these dialogues to be much more kind of honest and open um, stakeholders participated at every stage that was super important even at the stakeholder uh, even at the single stock assessment workshops it was really good to have stakeholders there too um, it was super informal and then disseminating results back was really useful. Um, fishers are still in the Irish Sea, they're really keen on pushing this work forward. Um, not too long ago they went to the Marine Institute for kind of an open day to look at the research that was going on and they were making it clear to the Marine Institute that they wanted to push ecosystem modelling and this kind of work forward. They wanted this to get funded because they were seeing this as a way to answer a lot of questions they had, especially in terms of um, they were interested in kind of the economic questions, also marine protected areas, so pushing it onto eco space. Um, they saw this as a way to kind of address a lot of their questions, but also input their knowledge and get involved more with the science, which they seem to really enjoy. I think we were quite lucky. I was definitely very lucky to fall in with <coughs> Dave Reed and the other people that have worked with these uh, fishers for so long. It was a really um, pleasant experience, but I've heard of situations where people haven't been so lucky. So I was really fortunate to be part of this process. Um, so after, after with this, the next thing to do or try to do was to get some form of ecosystem information from the model and into management. Um, and the way we wanted to do that was again working through ICs. Um, and ICs have this process of giving uh, multi-species, single species uh, ecosystem models something called a key run, um, which refers to a model parameterization output that is accepted as a standard um, by ICs working group and multi-species assessment methods. And once you've got uh, an ICs key run, in theory, your model can then be used to advise ICs products and be put into ICs products. Um, so this was a really good experience. It was in Rome in 2019, I think just before the EcoPath 35 conference. Um, we took the model to Rome uh, with this group of people in the bottom left picture. And it's kind of a week long review process where you have to present your model to them. Uh, they evaluate it and tell you what's wrong with it, tell you if they think anything's wrong with it, and you have to go away in that week and fix it or come up with suggestions of why things are wrong. So it's a really intense week, but a fantastic group of people, and um, there's even Rome as well, so it was really nice. Uh, but the reviews, I, I recommend anyone that's making an ecosystem model to go through this process, by the way, if they're in this area and they want to get their, their work into these kind of, this kind of advice. So if, if you're interested, the reviews evaluate the appropriateness of the model to the problem, so when you go, you have to suggest how you want to use your model 
um, to provide advice, which I'll go on to in the next few slides. So you have to go with that in mind, because then they'll gauge if your model is reasonable to solve that problem. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of models that go through this process want to, um, or these multi-species model, their aim is to incorporate natural mortality into the catch advice. So they've got a multi-species model that's better able to, cap the, to, to predict the natural mortality of certain stocks through predation. Um, and that's a lot, of, uh, a lot of models like to get the models ticked off and have that information put into the single stock assessments. And they check the assumptions of the model, so the scientific basis and um, infrastructure, that will fall down a lot too. If you've followed, if you're using a path of ecosin, I think they look at uh, the pre-bow, the best practices paper, so the pre-bow paper that Jason Link published in um, 2010 and Sheila Heyman's best practice paper in 2016 talk a lot through the best ways to kind of follow thermodynamic rules and uh, best ways to best best practices for building a model. So if you're going to do that, I'd suggest following those papers. They also look at the input data quality, um, where it's where you, where every parameter has come from, if you can back it up, how the model fits uh, observations, is it predictable, um, uh, what the uncertainty and sensitivity is like, and then uh, if there's any other peer review, so if there's publications or in um, <clears throat> in the RFC models um, case, we took it through the WK Irish process, so there was a lot of peer review there, kind of informal, but. WSAM, this meeting formed more of a, a um, formal peer review for the model to get it ticked off. Um, and if anyone's interested, we published a technical report for this showing how we went through the key run process and what kind of outputs were needed to present ICs in order to uh, have the model get a key run. So, um, so, so this could kind of talk about the idea that we've had for integrating ecosystem, ecosystem information into the catch advice now. Um, so we were working within the IC's advice framework. So we wanted to build a deeper understanding of the IC's advice framework and look for anywhere we could um, add ecosystem information now effectively, rather than um, have a, maybe a big step more towards multi-species uh, fishing mortality reference points and multi-species FMS wise. Um, we wanted to have something more that could be implemented now and be acceptable and could remain within the ICs framework. So ICs <laughs> follow the MSY principle, but they also have this kind of precautionary principle, which because of the uncertainty inherent in ecosystem models, they kind of, they can't stick too widely to these precautionary principles or can't be proven to be precautionary in the eyes of these kind of approaches. Um, so currently what ICs do for quite a few stocks is they provide an FMSY fishing reference point, so um, um, uh, fishing reference point, but they also add a range around this MFSY now, so MFSY, FMSY upper and FMSY lower. And it's the idea of you can remain within this range of fishing mortality and still be precautionary. Um, so the idea that we had going forward was, well, we've identified these ecosystem uh, trends which are important to stock production. So if temperatures are really high, we're going to say that potentially cod production is going to decrease, or if there's not a lot of zooplankton around, then we might see herring production decrease. And what you can do to reduce the fishing pressure at this point is if the ecosystem conditions are poor, you can move your fishing mortality reference point closer to FMSY lower. Or if the productivity is really good, so the temperature is not too high, there's lots of food available for herring, we can say you, you can more cautiously fish at FMSY upper. So avoiding um, you know, um, uh, being too overly cautious, but also being more precautionary when systems are bad. So it's a really, I think it's a really straightforward kind of approach, um, which, which people seem to be quite happy with because it still relies on the single species assessment models that integrates information from these ecosystem models in, into the advice. And it remains within, importantly, it remains within this precautionary area. So by moving within this realm, we're not adding additional risk to the stock um, going below uh, any of its biomass reference points, in theory. Um, so, so this is the FMS white, the F eco concept, which we so the reference point is um, being go, been going by F eco. Uh, so this is an example here. You find your significant stock specific ecosystem driver. In this case, it's the largely plankton indicator for herring, um, and you see kind of you you determine you determine the current status as, of this indicator relative to historic values of the indicator for your time series that you have. Um, so if we were going to derive an ecosystem condition value for the zooplankton indicator in the most recent year and use that to drive the, um, to drive the placement of F eco within the FMSY range, we can say that zooplankton indicators 
it's in relatively relatively good state at the moment. It's in the uh, upper third quartile. So you then apply that to the, F, the FE codes to FMSY range, and you can say you can fish in the you should fish around here, or, or we advise that based on ecosystem information, it's safe to fish around here, kind of thing. Um, whereas if if, if, the, if the ecosystem status was around here, so the largely plankton indicator was really low, we'd suggest fishing at um, uh, uh, the lower range of FMSY. Um, so we've run a few uh, retrospective simulations just to see uh, if since 1980 we did followed uh, F eco, so adjusting FMSY in line with the changes in productivity of zooplankton, how would that have impacted the biomass and catches of herring over time? So on the far left, we have the fishing, in the, the fishing mortality um, uh, scenarios. So the dark, the solid line is the actual um, FMSY, the actual fishing mortality that's been followed over time. The dotted line is stationary FMSY. And then the, the, the dashed line is the changing FMSY with uh, the condition of the largely plankton indicator over time. And it's also signified by the colors in the background. So when it's darker, it's a bad condition. So the F is going down, when it's, when it's blue, the F is going up. Um, and what we found, so again, the lines are the same. Um, during the bad ecosystem conditions, when you're fishing at F eco, it kind of acts as a buffer to the biomass and we don't see biomass drop as low. Uh, we have reduced catches, but um, it kind of balances out in the long run because during good uh, ecosystem conditions, you get kind of this opportunity to have a higher catch and be less overly cautious. Um, so I've just put some pros and cons of F eco. Um, so a pro of this approach would be that ecosystem understanding can be incorporated within the existing precaution framework. So it's not too arduous uh, a process to follow. It's already garnered quite a lot of approval within ICs. Um, I'm not too sure where it stands at the moment, but, but it's been getting quite a lot of support and it's been presented quite a bit. So hopefully we'll, we'll see this come to fruition. Um, and then the simulation suggests that FECO could act as a biomass buffer during periods of poor, poor productivity. Um, it acts as a way to operationally use EcoPath ecosystem models uh, for tactical catch advice. And it kind of achieves eco, uh, ecosystem approach to fisheries management, which moves us ever closer to the ecosystem-based fisheries management. Um, the cons of the approach so far is only, we've only tested linear, linear scaling. Um, in principle, there could be more complex relationships between environmental variables and changes in FMSY, which would be needed to investigate further. Um, FECO is a relatively small step in comparison to other advances such as multi-species MSY, uh, but it kind of gets us on the ladder to, to move towards something, I guess, rather than having something that's getting a lot of pushback. Um, and then there's also high data requirements for this approach. So in order to move in the FMSY range, the stock would need to have an FMSY range. I think it's about 60% of IC stocks have got insufficient data for this kind of range. So it's only the, the really heavy study commercial species that this kind of approach would be able to implement it for at this, at this point. Um, yeah, and just to finish, I'll just outline some more lessons from WK Irish. Um, so the first one is, uh, for, 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 for getting kind of for moving towards ecosystem-based approach to fishery management. So the first uh, lesson was that it was really important that the research objectives were aligned with the policy questions and frameworks that we had. So working closely with ICs and understanding where we could implement the information. Also having them in the room when we were working towards this kind of goal, got them used to seeing ecosystem models and pushing towards that. Um, Another important point was that we had dedicated collaboration between researchers, policy advisors, and stakeholders. Having that constantly was really important for the momentum of the project. I don't think we'd have um, been able to kind of do a lot of the things we were able to do if we weren't working so closely with them from the start, if it didn't come from the fishing industry initially, I don't think it would have been the momentum to carry it as far as it went. Um, following best practices to ensure models are rigorous um, and consistent must be useful to policy. I think that also attains to using best practices with the working with stakeholders. So having the, the informal open door kind of policies. And finally, the seeking out periodic reviews to ensure more utility and avoid rejection at formal review. Um, so WK Irish 5 was absolutely brutal. Uh, the model went through loads of changes post that. It was, it was a really intense review. Um, the peer reviews as well for publishing papers were quite intense. So lots of changes happened through them. But by the time we got to WG Sam, because of all of these kind of informal reviews that happened previously, um, the model was, um, was was able to get the key round, which was great. Um, so yeah, uh, finishing up, I guess, 
the best thing about this project was the community that formed around the model. It was uh, kind of gave the project momentum to move towards providing IC's advice. And there was a lot of people that contributed towards this. So it was a really, really cool project to be part of. Thank you, Jakob. Thank this you. is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Oh, and there was a quite a scary picture, the last one there. All those people so close together. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? Yeah. No, I've forgotten all about that. <laughs> no, there's a, it, it's it's really fantastic to see how far you move with this. Uh, it's uh, it's it's really neat. It's been great. And, yeah. yeah. No, it's been the, it's been amazing how well um, the modeling has been received as well. Uh, by the fishers and um, I mean the, the IRC model now has been pushed towards more directions with uh, climate change scenarios and we've got students up at SAMS looking into economic scenarios so it's great once we've got this key run on the ground just seeing other people take it up and do things with it so it's just I guess the possibilities of using these kind of things there's so many things that we can do with it now that it's up and running well, hopefully we can get back to the fishers and answer some more of their questions yeah and for those who don't know so much about ISIS, the key run is really important. A key run is a really well defined and described run of a model. It's not the best run or anything like that. It is one that's really well described, documented, reviewed. People know the properties of it and then we look from there to what happens and use that as a starting point. So that's, that's pretty neat. Um, we're going to have um, there's a number of papers describing that. You'll find those papers in the readings, and uh, I hope you have been looking at them. And uh, Jacob, you're going to get a, a few minutes break now, in the sense that we're going to uh, have a brief introduction to three of your papers. Right. And uh, it's just a, a one minute, uh, one slide thing. Mariam, do you want to go first? No, she's not here. Oh. Then she can't go first. Jeff, in that case. Yeah, I'm here. Good. Okay, so I will be introducing uh, a paper combining scientific and fishers knowledge to co-create indicators of food web structure and function. I'll essentially be <laughs> repeating a lot of the things that Jakob has already talked about. Um, here we have a picture of uh, the study area and the extent of the IRC ecopath model that uh, Jakob's been talking about. Um, the main objective of this paper, goal of this paper, I thought was to determine how fishers knowledge can aid fisheries management when combined with scientific knowledge, and also to document the approach of success with co-production and collaboration with fishers, between fishers and scientists. And some of the key findings that uh, the paper talked about was the impact of incorporating Fisher's knowledge. Um, the important ones included that Fisher's, incorporating Fisher's knowledge identified 30 new predator-prey interactions in the food web and also uh, modified 14% of flows uh, in the model from the without Fisher's knowledge uh, scenario. Um, they found good agreement between fishers knowledge and available scientific data which reinforces both sources of information and promotes greater trust between both groups this is important for future collaborations as there needs to be that trust there otherwise um, the groups will want to work, work together or share knowledge with each other um, so moving on there were two limitations that were pointed out in the study one was that only six out of 41 species in the food web model was considered uh, and modified for the Fisher's knowledge incorporation, which limited the scope to observe the impact of Fisher knowledge on the entire food web and ecosystem. The second one was that uh, Fisher's knowledge quantified was quantified based on the assembled value from from scientific data, and this restricted the impact of Fisher's knowledge as it tied everything down to uh, essentially scientific data and restricts being able to fully incorporate the effects of fishers knowledge in the ecosystem. So the conclusion of the paper was that fishers knowledge uh, is useful and is detailed and does maintain scientific rigor, but it is severely underused. And the approach that the WK Irish has taken uh, should be 
replicated in other areas. Great. Thank you, Jeff. And Adeba, did you want to uh, continue? Yes, Ocha. So um, I'm about to just re echo what um, Jacob said um, 10 minutes into his talk. And I was to review um, the paper which actually talked about um, how Fisher's knowledge um, improved the accuracy of food web model predictions. So um, actually this has made significant progress um, with regards to incorporating um, the expertise of Fisher's um, into research and management. And um, Fisher's knowledge is very essential um, to the ecosystem modeler. Um, because of the personal expertise of fishers in terms of habitat preferences, fishing efforts, and dietary preferences, and so on. So integrating and sharing in the knowledge is actually a good way to um, instill um, credibility and some kind of collaboration between the fish and the fishery stakeholders and scientists. So um, after reading this, um, paper, I was able to gather that um, there were actually four steps, four types of um, fishing effort information used. Um, the first was the fishers knowledge and um, the adjusted fishers knowledge, the scientific knowledge, and there was also the hybrid knowledge. So the hybrid knowledge at the end was what was selected as the best fit um, for the model since it had a higher confidence interval. And um, the hybrid was like a combination of the Fisher's knowledge and the scientific knowledge. Um, the Fisher's knowledge had to do with um, Fisher's given a narrative of the knowledge they had. So um, from Jacob's um, presentation, um, well, when the Fisher's give their narrative, it is then interpreted into graphs and the trends are further explain to the fishers and as to whether the trends explain what they actually shared um, is going to be agreed or disagreed on. So the hybrid knowledge was kind of a combination of this to the fishers knowledge and the scientific knowledge from the scientists. So at the end of reading this paper, I was able to gather that um, fishers knowledge improved the food web model. I just have like, two interesting diagrams, which I just um, screen munched and attached to my um, slide. And um, so in the end, this model, um, I mean, in the end, the Fisher's knowledge um, was agreed. Um, it was agreed that the Fisher's knowledge was important in um, model predictions. Yes, so that's just about my tip. Well, thank you very much, Adepa. Thank you. And that means we can open it for questions, the presentation. While we're waiting for someone, uh, Catalin, do you want to ask yours? Hi, yes. Um, I was just wondering, it's a very nice uh, figure you have on slide seven where you're depicting the Irish Sea Ecobath model. And I was just wondering what kind of software did you use when you know you put this figure together? Yeah. Um, so at the moment I use um, Adobe Illustrator quite a lot. I find that's really, really good for drawing these kind of infographics. Um, at the time of making that figure, I was using PowerPoint. Um, it was kind of my first venture into kind of making infographics because this seemed to be a really great way to communicate with the fishers. It was something they really um, kind of they, they enjoyed seeing and especially made the presentations a lot better. But yeah, I made that one with PowerPoint and that took forever because um, there was like 400 predator-prey interactions. And if you look at the figure, I actually drew like 400 dotted lines across that in PowerPoint, so it was just ridiculous. Um, but yeah, so it, it's just, um, it was just uh, importing pictures of fish from the internet, kind of drawing over them, and coloring them, that kind of thing. So it was all straightforward, but I'd advise if anyone's going to do it, do it in something like Illustrator instead of PowerPoint because it'll crash your computer. Along those lines, your 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 brief, ecosystem brief there is, is fantastic. Oh, and even more so, who made that ISIS logo? Which one? The uh, one with the... 
Diego Paradises. Oh, that was me. And that's oh. your room sitting under the tree. Oh, it's beautiful. Jerome <laughs> uh, actually has a question, question from, from Facebook. Yeah, I posted it uh, from Miriam Putz. She wanted to know if F F eco only works when your model represents the same area as your assessments available, right? That's a good question. Um, I have something I haven't really thought about. So with the Irish Sea, our model um, covers the extent of the IC's Irish Sea region. So all stocks, which are Irish Sea stocks, um, it covers the extent of those stocks. But I guess Miriam, I think Miriam works with the, the Southern North Sea model, which I imagine the North Sea um, assessments cover the whole of the North Sea. So I'm not too sure. Um, I'm sure there would be some way to use a, a, a model of just some extent of the, of the um, region to provide advice for a stock that covers maybe a whole region, especially if maybe your stock presides in, in mainly, mainly in your area of the model and that's why you're seeing this big environmental driver having an impact. But I imagine it would still be important for stocks which are in these larger spatial units. But yeah, it's a good question I haven't really thought. Okay, Shaya, do you want to ask? Um, yeah, right. So, uh, in research, I understand that eventually the best fit was uh, not to make uh, forcing on uh, on the primary production, but only try to send right the temperature or the surface temperature on the on the on the zooplankton and some of the fish species. If I understood right, and then more a technical question is that uh, if uh, EWE uh, can we have uh, forcing on the primary production uh, externally, uh, other than constant, of course, and can we have temperature effects on the different species of primary production and low plankton and so on, uh, so that we can simulate uh, uh, climate change and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so, so the question is, can you um, add a forcing function to primary production in the model? Is that rather than just zooplankton and the fish species? Sorry, is that what? Yes, that is kind of the question. Yeah, yeah. That's, part, that's part of the first part of the question. Right, yeah. No, yeah, you totally can. If, if you think primary production has changed in your ecosystem and you know what driver has been changing it, then you can apply that to the, uh, you can apply driver directly to the prime production rate of phytoplankton or other uh, prion producers in your model. Uh, that can be done. And that's something that uh, people have been doing a lot. I know Natalie Sapetti has been doing that uh, with her ecospace model of the West Coast of Scotland. Um, she's been using prime production outputs from an ERSAM uh, lower trophic model and using that to drive phytoplankton over time and space. Um, Chiara Pirelli's just uh, had a paper accepted as well, where she's done the same, uh, applying changes in production to a number of different models across um, across different ice regions and around around Europe. So it's totally something we can do. So we've been taking outputs from prime production models uh, and coupling them with EcoPath and EcoSim effectively. And the second part is how you make environmental drivers impact individual groups. Oh, so there's lots of different ways to have environmental drivers impact in your groups. Um, so in, in, in Ecosim, you can apply uh, temperature trends or temperature anomalies to changes in, uh, for, for, for functional groups, you can apply it to changes in their, um, if you've got a multi stanza you can try to change in their uh, recruitment. You can apply um, changes um, if you've got a link between that and consumption, their vulnerabilities. You can alter vulnerabilities as well, but what we play a lot with now is functional responses. Um, so if you know the temperature tolerance range of a functional group, you can apply a, a tolerance level to that species. So it would just look like a Gaussian curve or, or a trapezoid where they have a minimum and a maximum threshold. And when you have an environmental variable like temperature in the model, it will look at the, the temperature change every year and, and go back to the, um, the functional response and if it's at the optimum. Of, of the species functional response, so it's at its optimum temperature, then the, the species will ha have a consumption rate close to its optimum. And as you go towards the tails, if the temperature starts to go up and this moves out of the, the Gaussian curve that you've given that species, then you know, its production will start to be negatively influenced. And you can do the same with changes in temperature or um, acidity or, or, or pH or, 
or, or salinity. So you can just add these functional responses, environmental pressures. I think there's ones for depth and stuff like that as well as you can see uh, in eco space, which you can add functional responses to depth. So there's uh, lots of different ways to implement um, and implement environmental drivers into the model, which is why it's important to try and ground yourself with a mechanistic understanding of what is actually happening. Because if you think temperature is something that's driving your stock, there's probably about five different ways to add temperature to a stock production. So I think having this mechanistic understanding of what's actually going on. So for example, we identified that it was potentially recruitment that was being negatively impacted by changes in temperature. We were able to add the temperature driver straight onto recruitment. But if you think it's something else, like a direct metabolic impact, then a functional response might be more appropriate. And if any of you aren't quite sure about how to do that, then you're in the right place because we will be talking a lot about that in the next couple of months. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. All right, I don't see any more questions right now in the chat. Oh, we have uh, from Rosa on Facebook. Uh, it's from Rosa Marcuna. As you know that the data could not describe your network well, can you suggest some changes for the existing monitoring program? What data would be would really be needed or wanted for further modeling? Um, as we move on, I think that's a really important question because the interaction between the modeling and the monitoring is something we um, we need to strengthen the, the modeling's role in this. But Jakob. Sorry, what did you say, Billy? Did you want to comment on that, on data, um, on the imp on how the um, modeling give guidelines for the monitoring programs? What feedback there may be for, in other words, what for the IOC, mm -hmm. did you find that there were data that ought to be part of the monitoring? I see. You really missed? Um, no, not directly. Um, no, not really. We we try to pass off the um, effort trends to more um, different different kind of projects that we think would be useful in that kind of information. Because I think a lot of the the things with um, well, I guess yeah, because a lot of the things that Ecopath Vegason does, and well, in my experience, is it, it raises a lot of questions. It also answers questions, but it, it raises a lot of issues. So you find out where your data is insufficient. So a lot of the thing, issues we had with the IRC model is we couldn't find a lot of data for a lot of the lyotrophic organisms. So it really raised the point of needing more monitoring programs to kind of go out and collect data in those areas. Good, thank you. Are there other questions? I don't see any. Oh. Yeah, what do you think should we uh, should we overload them by uh, giving some uh, some fancy time series fitting? Yeah, I'm happy to, or I'm happy to come back at a different time of day, whatever you think is best. Yes, uh, we have an exclamation mark from Santiago. He wants he wants more. Okay. Yes, it would be great, Jacob, and uh, yeah. to give us this introduction to uh, a more advanced time series fitting. Mm -hmm. I'll share the screen. Good. So am I right in thinking you went through a lot of this with Dave the other day as well? Did he start instructions to the fitting? Uh, he demonstrated his model. So we were actually looking at uh, some of the fitting aspects uh, mm -hmm. based on uh, a demo of the model. And we talked a bit about it. But your, uh, your presentation uh, really adds to this. And it describes the uh, the module, uh, the the SAMS model that uh, we didn't talk about last time at all. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just a brief presentation into fitting the model. Um, we we'll start with why we want to fit the model. Is the aim of this is to produce some simulations which we can uh, represent observed temporal data. So when we uh, have our observed biomass and catch time series that we add to the model, we want to make sure our model can accurately kind of closely replicate that in order to better 
understand and underpin the drivers which are impacting the ecosystem. We want to make sure our model is capable of replicating trends so we can start to dive into what it is that's actually forcing models to replicate those trends. Is it uh, the environmental drivers we've added or the vulnerabilities we've estimated? Um, and during the fitting procedure, we test uh, a number of alternative plausible hypotheses or models to, achess, to achieve um, a best fit. Um, and these hypotheses uh, include whether or not we want to include phishing as a driver. Do we think phishing has been important for our ecosystem? Uh, is it the vulnerabilities? So the top-down or bottom-up interactions between predators and prey, is this what's been driving their dynamics? Or is it something like temperature? Um, and we determine which model is the best model using uh, we do some squares, which tells us the difference between our observed, uh, the observed data and our predictions, but also using the Kiki's information criterion which uses some of squares, but it penalizes you for the number of parameters that you estimate so that you don't overfit your model. Um, so potentially, because you could keep on throwing uh, estimates of parameters at your model, uh, more and more environmental drivers, more spline points to your anomaly, and your SS would just keep on going down and down and down until eventually it hits zero and you've overfitted your model. But with AIC, this would be counteracted with um, the AIC. So what you want is, what. so the best model is determined by the lowest AIC value. Um, and if you keep on throwing parameters at, at your model to try and overfit it, then the AIC is going to increase. Uh, so it's penalizing you for adding uh, over overfitting your model essentially. Uh, so why are we doing this? So we want to replicate observed trends to address scientific queries and advice management. Um, yeah, and provide some qualitative way to explain which forcing factors influence model dynamics. Um, so here there are the equations for Akiki's information criteria. Um, so it's a tool for model selection, which I said penalizes you for fitting too many parameters. Um, it uses the sum of squares, uh, but with EcoPath of Ecosim, we use AICC, which is a version of the equation um, that, uh, uh, that, that is suited to small sample sizes. Um, we count each time series that we're trying to fit as one sample because time series such as catch and biomass are often autocorrelated. So each time series will count as one sample. So we use AICC to determine which is the best fit model. Um, so these are the eight different types of hypotheses you can test when you're fitting your model. Um, you can test the baseline, which includes no environmental or fisheries data uh, or vulnerabilities. It's just, uh, it, it's just the base model. It's, it tends to not do too much. And then you can do the baseline and trophic interactions where you have no fishing, but you estimate vulnerabilities. So these changes in top down and bottom up multipliers, which impact how the biomass of the predator impacts the biomass of the prey. Um, I don't know if you've spoken much about uh, vulnerabilities, um, but it's a, it's, it's a part of the foraging arena theory to quantify uh, these vulnerabilities, which represent the degree to kind of which um, a change in predator biomass will impact prey mortality. Um, they kind of range from one to infinity with two being the default and vulnerabilities between one and two suggest a bottom up control where even a small chain or even a large change in predator biomass will have a very limited impact on uh, the prey. So that's a bottom up control. Uh, or you could have a top down impact where the changes in the predator biomass, which is anything above two, changes in the predator biomass um, will impact prey, prey, prey consumption, the consumption of the prey. Um, <clears throat> and then you have baseline environment uh, it's a hypothesis where you you have um, uh, you estimate, for example, a spline point of prime production anomaly. So you estimate a, a curve to change the production rate over time. Um, this is another way you can fit the model. And then you have a baseline, traffic interactions, and environment. So you've got the vulnerabilities being estimated and the spline point anomaly on the prime production. And then again, the same kind of hypotheses, but this time for fishing. So you include your fishing effort drivers or your fishing mortality drivers. Uh, as well as estimating traffic interactions and uh, environment and uh, traffic interactions and environment. Um, in my case, uh, the, the, the models I've worked with have been the Norwegian Barents Seas and around, around the UK and Ireland. So fisheries have always been a big component of these models. So we always find that when we are fitting a model, the fisheries are always included in the best fit or in, in the set of best fit models that we can find because fisheries have played a huge role in the dynamics of stocks over time. Um, so I think Dave might show you this page. This is the fitting to time series module that's built into, uh, is in Ecosim tools. Um, so you go down to Ecosim and then tools button, and then down there you can fit to time series where you can um, search for uh, how many uh, vulnerabilities you want to 
estimate, you can estimate either predator or predator prey vulnerabilities. If you estimate a predator vulnerability, it will estimate uh, one value across all of a predator's prey. So for example, if you estimated a predator vulnerability for column two, it would look for, it would estimate one uh, value between one and infinity across all of those prey. So that predator would have the same top down or bottom impact, a bottom up impact across all of its prey. If you search for predator prey um, vulnerabilities, then it will search for the most sensitive relationships within uh, within that predator's, uh, uh, within that column for that predator. Um, so sensitive being if we change this, if we change the vulnerability of this relationship, it will have a big impact on the fit of the model. It will improve the model substantially and it will just pick out the, the most sensitive ones and change them. Um, Okay, um, and you can select if you want to search for an anomaly and the vulnerability uh, and, and the vulnerabilities or just one or the other, and you can switch between them at the top here. I'm not sure if you'll, you'll probably go through this um, again, I imagine. Um, so this is what the anomaly tab looks like. You have, at the moment, this is attached to prime production, which uh, you can do in Ecosim. Um, so this is the forcing function that's gonna be driving phytoplankton. At the moment, it's just a, a flat line, so it's not going to be changing phytoplankton productivity over time. It's just set at one. But when you start to estimate spline points, um, it, it, when the model's fitting, it will start to iterate this trend. So it moves uh, kind of to produce a curve that impacts prior production rates. <coughs> so once you've uh, applied your, you've, to, you've, to, you've told the, the plugin that you want to search for vulnerabilities, you want to search for an anomaly search. Um, you can begin fitting, you can press start at the button and you'll see each iteration, the iterations pop up, pop, pop in that box. You'll see it gradually, um, the, the summer squares and AIC gradually change as the model starts to fit and it runs through different iterations. Um, so this is an approach that Moritz Stover published um, called the parsimonious approach where what he did was continue to add estimated vulnerabilities. So, um, <clears throat> in, until uh, the reduction in sum of squares is outweighed by AIC. Um, so the best fit scenario here uh, was 32 um, vulnerabilities were estimated after estimating more vulnerabilities for the model, the AIC uh, increased more than the SS reduced. So he kind of found the best fit within that, in that, in, 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 in that set of models that he produced. Um, but the issue with this and using that manual um, way to fit models, you can you can go in there and you can say, I want to estimate uh, 25 vulnerabilities. Um, and then you want to say, okay, but what's it like if I estimate 24 vulnerabilities? What's it like if I estimate 23 vulnerabilities? Every time you have to go in and do that manually and it's quite time consuming. Um, it's uh, really prone to human error. If you keep on going into that plugin and you keep on changing things and going back out again, um, and it's just, for example, it's, so it can be very time consuming and repetitive. Uh, for example, for the Norwegian Aberrant Seas model that we worked on, it had four, 33 functional groups. We had 28 reference time series. So it meant we could estimate a maximum of 27 parameters to fit the model. So 27 vulnerabilities and spline points included in that 27. Um, so testing all possible combinations of vulnerabilities across the, uh, the matrix would have resulted in a possible 758 model iterations or combinations of vulnerabilities that we could have tested. And going into that manual fitting and trying every single one of those combinations would have been uh, impossible. It would have taken a crazy amount of time and there would have been a lot of error associated with it. Um, so something that was developed a few years ago now was this stepwise fitting plugin um, uh, that, that undertakes the statistical fitting man um, automatically. It can run through all these different iterations, all these different hypotheses that I mentioned earlier. Um, which is in the tools bar at the top. Um, and in this stepwise fitting plugin box, you can say if you want to search for predator or predator prey vulnerabilities, uh, you can select if you want to estimate an anomaly on prime production. Um, and then you can tell it how many variabilities you want to estimate. And you can choose your hypotheses on the right hand side. You can tick through them and you can see what it will do is it will run through all these different iterations one at a time. Um, and when, when you actually do run it, I don't know if I've got a screen. 
millinery. So when you run through it, you'll see it ticking down them one at a time. So it will start on fishing, which is just fitting the model to, to fishing. It's not estimating any parameters at this point. It's not estimating a spline point. Uh, anomaly in phytoplankton, it's just what is the fit of the model against observed data if we just have fishing effort in the model. And then the next time it will estimate one vulnerability, um, predator or predator prey based on what you've selected. So within that predator prey matrix, it will suggest which is the most sensitive interaction that I want to add, uh, change the top down and bottom up nature here. So for the IRC model, for example, um, uh, zooplankton had a bottom up impact on herring. So that's a, a really sensitive vulnerability. So it would have been above two and it meant that uh, zooplankton would have driven herring through bottom up processes. So it would kind of look for those really sensitive interactions and it would change them and it would go through one at a time. And this can take a long time to, to run. Um, for the IRC model, I think it takes a week to get through everything. It, you leave your computer going for a week to go through all of these uh, iterations. Then you can save uh, like aggregated results at the end. So you get a really nice CSV file that comes out with all of this information in it. So you can actually look at what the best fit model was. <clears throat> so yeah, this, is, uh, this, this shows you what the program looks like after you've run it. So you can see it's gone through every single iteration. Uh, K is the number of parameters that have been estimated. Uh, Vs is the number of vulnerabilities that have been estimated and spline points if there's a prime production anomaly. And then you've got the, the statistical information. So the summer squares and your AIC. And it's highlighted the best fit model there. So it says that the model is best fit with 39 vulnerabilities estimated and the spline point on production, which has got seven points. So it's quite a wiggly spline point, uh, quite a wiggly trend on phytoplankton. Um, and then you can see it's got the lowest AIC out of that list and uh, relatively low uh, sum of squares. Um, oh yeah, so here, this is what your output will look like on the left. So this is when you click run, it will start saving everything in a folder of your choice and you'll get these CSVs which show you the anomalies that have been predicted, <coughs> the, the biomass trends that are coming out from these different model fits. Um, but really usefully at the bottom, there's this um, stepwise fitting iteration results uh, folder uh, file, which comes out as the one on the right where it has all of your iterations on the left, and then the, the statistical fitting columns. And then it tells you actually the contribution of each functional group towards the overall fitting. So, um, so for example, there you've got tooth whales, minke whales, and seabirds, and that would be the sum of squares for that functional group's biomass trend in particular, which adds onto the overall sum of squares. So you can go through and you can, if you were more interested in picking a model that was really good at fitting your commercial stocks and not that interested in how it fits, um, your marine mammals, you can actually look for these iterations and say, okay, that doesn't fit two whales very well, but what was the fit like for cod and things like that? So you can start to uh, play with this and see what the impact of different uh, fittings were on your model. Um, and this is just some examples of where these results have been presented in publications. Um, for some, uh, I just wanted to highlight here that in some cases, you might find that there are multiple models which you can, you can um, assume are the best models. There's a tends to be a rule of thumb where if it's within, uh, if you've got a model that's within two AICC of each other, so these three models here, for example, which are highlighted in the red box, have got really close AIC values. It's below what you say is, is um, delta two. Um, they are con they are considered to all be the best models because they're very close within the statistical fitting. So either one, either one of these can be considered to be the best model in this model set. Um, and then another example um, of the uh, fitting, you can see here's the different scenarios that were tested. So you've got the baseline and then fishing and what the best fit was from uh, the automated fitting for all of these uh, hypotheses with the, the, the best um, scenario highlighted in bold at the bottom, which included fishing, trophic interaction and some form of environmental change. In my experience, they'll, they often do include fishing, trophic interactions, and some type of environmental change, because these all tend to be things that are really important for the changes in production and uh, stock status. Um, and then on the bottom left, there's a, a graph of how changing, uh, adding uh, these different components to the fitting process helped reduce the sum of squares over time. Uh, so you can see that the sum of squares reduced pretty drastically with the addition of trophic interactions, which seems to be quite important for that model. So the addition of vulnerabilities to the, to the model fit. And yeah, and there's some references included as well, um, if you want to read more on that. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Jacob. 
Are there any uh, comments or questions? Jerome, you can mention what you wrote there. Yeah, sure. Just just a little uh, update. We've worked in the code to make uh, the step by fitting routine much faster. You, the process is just lengthy. It doesn't occupy a whole lot of computing space, but it just needs to chuck through the wood. Um, so we, we multi-threaded it, and for every uh, computational core that you have in your computer, it will run two stepwise fitting threads at the same time. On my development machine, it turns out uh, it basically runs 16 at the same time, and it finishes about 16 times faster than before, which is adds, adds to the utility of the tool, I think. So that, that's coming. That's amazing. Yeah, it's very well. It made sense. Just yeah. need to be done. I could see uh, Jakob's, ben to, ben, uh, Jakob's uh, body language saying, why didn't I have that? To make you wait for something, come on. Yeah, good things. All right. Are there other, other questions or anything else? I know it's a bit overwhelming, uh, but I hope it's uh, that it gives you a good picture of what can be done with this. And uh, we will be exploring this much more, more in, the, in uh, the coming weeks. And indeed, the presentation that uh, Jakob gave here uh, would be one that I could easily repeat for you uh, when we meet again Tuesday after Reading Week. Um, I will explain it differently, but it's going to be exactly the same content and ideas here. So I think it is a, a, a great introduction to how we'll be proceeding. Yeah. Very nice. It's, yeah, it's amazing that the more people we have on the call, uh, the more difficult it is to get a discussion going. No, it's not amazing. It's natural that it is like that, yeah. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you, everyone. That was really great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That was nice. Very good. And you've got Natalia coming next as well, haven't you? She after reading week. Second, please. Natalie is talking uh, next Thursday, isn't she, or the Thursday? In, in two weeks from now, yeah. And Natalie will be talking about um, uh, some of the environmental drivers, I think, uh, is going to be a big part of that, yeah. That'd be really good. Yeah, okay. Anyway, we uh, we are getting to uh, we are getting close to reading week, so next week is a is a good opportunity to uh, read. That's what it's about, certainly here at UBC, and. Um, the, the plan then is that we well we continue you know what, what's what's in the plan uh, but uh, I will one of the things I will be doing is to prepare the assignments for for the coming weeks and uh, I would like to invite everyone that uh, you are mo you're welcome to uh, to hand in those assignments as we move along even the first one if you haven't done so already and those who are not officially registered for the course. Um, we will do our best to comment uh, upon what what you send in. And that, with that, uh, I don't really have more. I, I have one uh, more question. Uh, in the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned a, a model ensemble that uh, you or your colleagues did. Can you get some more elaborate about it and how you analyzed it? It together yeah yeah sure yeah sorry I forgot to touch on that again um, we had some issues along the way um, I think kind of uh, when we set out initially to have an ensemble there wasn't many issues um, but then brexit came along and I think a lot of the attention that was going to be paid to these multi-species models got refocused in other areas with the um, so by the end of WK Irish um, the ecopar vixen model was the only kind of uh, operational model in that sense. The um, Moses model came along a bit later, but the, the Le Mans model as well was starting to show results towards the end that were very similar to the Ecopath of Ecosyn model. Um, for example, we were both showing the importance of cod as a top-down predator in the region, so we were coming out of these kind of similar conclusions. But because of the, the rate of development of the models, we never got to formally compare them. Um, so we didn't actually get to that stage. We're hoping to get to that stage eventually, I imagine. The, the IRC is now set up for a a good um, multi-model multi program. Um, but there are other regions where it's been done. I know Lillian Martin has worked on the global uh, model ensemble that was recently published. And 
Um, Mike Spence at CFAS has been doing some really interesting work with how to take the strengths from multiple modeling types and combine them to give uh, more coherent outputs. So there are definitely some really great papers that I can uh, link in the comments of where it has been done. Unfortunately, we didn't get to that stage. Good. Um, Mariam is asking uh, about, are there any plans for the IOC to look at spatial issues? Uh, so would, would this model be uh, implemented also as a spatial model for that? Have you been discussing that? Yeah, something we talk about quite a lot is moving to space because it's something that fishers are really interested in. It's something that I'm excited to start doing again. Um, I did it previously with your room for the Clyde Sea and that was a lot of fun. So we're hoping to do something. I keep on trying to push uh, uh, towards that. I was even thinking about trying to build an eco space model in my free time, but um, I don't know that would just be, I don't know how that would be received. <laughs> what kind of questions are there that are spatially explicit for the IOC? Well, there's a lot of interest in the, um, from the fishers at least, for the area closures, um, for the impact on the stocks with the area closures, because it's quite, um, I guess, political and contentious, whether they were necessary. Um, so I think that is something that would be interesting to explore the impact of the area closures and how that's working. Um, other things, I guess, for the Irish Sea, we're at that kind of, we're at that temperature threshold. It seems to be a temperature threshold for a lot of stocks at the moment, which are migrating north with climate change. Um, so I know cod and things like that are at its temperature tolerance range, and we're seeing more uh, species coming in with the warming waters. So in that terms, it would be very interesting to try and model the changes in distribution of climate change and IPCC scenarios. So that's something that would be interesting to do. And uh, Spencer is asking about uh, ecospace models for west of Scotland. What has happened there? And who yes, so that's um, Natalia Sapetti, who's going to be talking uh, in two weeks. She works with the West Coast Scotland model. Um, it's a really, really great ecospace model. So it's uh, it's coupled with um, it's coupled. So it's it's, it's 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 she's used it for new multiple ways, which I think she will talk about. One of the ways she'll talk about probably in a couple of weeks is the way she's used it with um, a new. Uh, is it is it it's an aquaculture kind of energy unit that they're placing in the area and they're having a look at the environmental impact of that kind of construction. But she's also you worked with you in closely with the, the spatial temporal framework where she's used phytoplankton and lower trophic productivity to drive the model from the bottom up. But she's also constrained the model top down from uh, from uh, marine mammal data that she has from GAMS and other modeling. So it's really I think it's a really nice example of. Uh, an eco-space model, um, so hopefully she'll go into a little more depth on that in a couple of weeks. She probably will, and it's also been used to evaluate the impact of noise on marine yeah. mammals. That's it. Okay, we are getting up to uh, having uh, used uh, the two hours at our disposal, and uh, I would like to uh, thank you all, and especially Jakob Bentley, for uh, showing up and for Jakob for giving an absolutely uh, astonishing presentation of some neat, great work. Thank you very much, Jakob, and thank you all. Thank you.